Well, good morning, everybody. Alrighty, um, lots of you know that uh, for since the beginning of the year, we started a series called One Story, and we are taking, uh, we're teaching away all the way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning, opening cover to the back cover. And uh, we are creeping right up on the dividing line between uh, Old Testament and New Testament. Within a few weeks, we'll be moving over to the New Testament, but we are right now in the season of the prophets, the, uh, the prophets of Israel uh, from the Old Testament, which are generally around 800 BC all the way up to about 400 BC. And we're, we're wrapping this up right now. Today we're gonna be looking at the prophet Micah. Say that with me, Micah. Not Michael, not Mikey really likey, but Micah. All right, let me start with this. Think for just a moment about basic human emotions, anger, joy, sadness, comfort, serenity, things like that. Which of the, as we've been studying the prophets, which of these basic human emotions do you tend to associate with the tone of the prophets? You don't want to say it, but it's anger, isn't it? It's anger. We tend to think that, that it's anger. I mean, the prophets kind of seem like cranky guys, don't they? Sometimes they do. I'm going to give you a few examples. Prophet Amos that we talked about last week, uh, Amos says, said this, we, we read this verse. Amos says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who oppress the poor and crush the needy. That just sounds like a cranky thing to say, doesn't it? And then there's the prophet Isaiah. I, prophet Isaiah said, stop bringing meaningless offerings. I can't bear your evil assemblies. And then the prophet Micah, who we'll be looking at today, he says, he puts it like this. Listen, you leaders. You are supposed to know right from wrong, but you are the very ones who hate good and love evil. Ow. And he goes on. You skin my people alive and tear their flesh from their bones. Then you beg the Lord for help in times of trouble. Yikes. I mean, not only do they use angry words, but the prophets in the Old Testament sometimes resort to shock tactics that seem almost downright bizarre. Uh, Hosea, the prophet, Mary's a prostitute, just to show people how unfaithful God says they are as a people. The prophet Ezekiel eats food cooked over human waste to show people how defiled they are. Then the prophet Jeremiah digs up filthy buried underwear and uses it as an object lesson to, to show people how repellent their behavior is before God. I mean, we read stuff like this and we just don't like it very much. We like happy books, don't we? We like happy devotionals and things like that. So why should we read all this? Well, for one thing, because it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible, and that's why we read it. And we are reminded of how important that is in 1 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. All scripture, say that with me, all scripture. That's why we read all of it, not just the fuzzy happy parts. Now, uh, it wouldn't be a good thing to get to heaven and have the prophet Malachi walk up to you and say, hey, how'd you like my book? <laughs> and you say, Malachi? I thought it was Malachi, like Chachi. You know, I thought you were an Italian prophet or something like that. <laughs> but there's a reason why God chose 17 books out of the Bible to be the prophets. There's a reason for the tone of the prophets. Uh, imagine this, especially for those that are musicians or singers. Imagine you're, you're listening to somebody sing and they're singing off key, like badly and loud. Now, if you have a tin ear, well, it doesn't bother you that much. But if you're musically inclined, if you're musically sensitive, if you have perfect pitch, it'll drive you crazy. It's a different story because you know what the song could be. You know what the song should be. Now, imagine listening to that noise hour after hour, day after day, year after year, and how difficult that would be for that kind of person. Now, so we read the prophets and we think, what's the big deal? What's the big deal here? What are they getting all heated up about? And people think like this, I know there's violence in our world and I see it out there and it's bad, I know, but as long as it doesn't touch my life, as long as it doesn't touch my neighborhood, well, I'd prefer not to think about it. Thank you very much. Or someone says, I, yeah, sure, I lie a little bit, but doesn't everyone? I mean, you don't really be, 
expect me to be 100% truthful, do you? Really? Or somebody says, yeah, okay, I fudge a little bit in my business, I fudge a little bit on my taxes, but hey, isn't that the American way? Somebody else says, so there's problems in the world, but they're way out there. Those problems all out there couldn't be connected to my fallenness or my anger or my apathy or my lack of love. And it's like, so what if in ancient Israel the poor got ripped off? I mean, where is it any different? Somebody shades the truth a little bit. Somebody gets a little wrapped up in their own comfort. Someone gets a little careless about remembering those who are in need. And the prophets act like the world is falling apart. What's the deal? What's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. The prophets have been given from God this crushing burden of looking at our world and seeing what God sees. Powerful people trying to get richer and looking the other way while poor people suffer. And they just think that God's pretty pleased with their lives in general. It's like, hey, my world around me is going pretty well, so don't bother me with all that stuff. I don't want to hear it. You know, every one of the prophets learns something about the human race, and it's this. Sometimes we don't really want to know the truth. Sometimes we have a deeply vested interest in not getting it. We don't want to know what sin has done in our lives or to our compassion or to our generosity or what it's done to our world. I mean, sometimes we just truthfully don't want to know because that would make us uncomfortable. And interesting, the prophet Micah says these words in Micah 2.11. He says, if a liar and a deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, he would be just the prophet for these people. Think about that. So here's a follow-up question. What's, what is beer made to do? Does it make you more comfortable or more alert? You're looking at me like, we are in church. Pastor Chip, I don't even know what it is that you're speaking of. I've never even heard of beer. It's good to have the Pharisees with us this morning. Just take a shot in the dark. Does beer make you more comfortable or more alert? More comfortable, right? That's why Micah says these things, because that's what people want. We don't want anybody to talk to us about human misery because it might disturb our comfort. We just get used to our world, the way we get used to stuff around our house that hasn't been fixed for the longest of time. We just, we don't even see it. We don't notice it anymore, do we? Well, you know what? The prophets noticed. They noticed. That was their gift, and that was their burden. One scholar put it this way. He said, the prophet is a man who feels fiercely. God has thrust a burden upon his soul, and he's bowed and bent, uh, bowed and stunned at man's fierce greed. Prophecy is the voice God has lent to the silent agony. So the prophets speak for God. They see what he sees, and they feel what God feels. That is why we read the prophets. Now, how do we respond to what they say? What should we do? Do I just get overwhelmed by all the wrongs in our world because it's way more than I could ever fix? I mean, should we just be stunned into silence and sit around doing nothing all day long, feeling overwhelmed by guilt? Well, no. The prophet Micah kind of sums up the response that God is looking for in one of the great verses of the entire Old Testament. And it's the only statement I'm going to ask you to carry away with you today because if you grasp this one thing, you really grasp the heart of the prophets, all 17 books of them. And in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, here's what he says. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn? And I bet that Micah paused right there and then looked into the eyes of his listeners. And then he said, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. It's like God has already shown you. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now you notice the escalation as Micah lays out what lavish sacrifices to God might look like. Burnt offerings and calves and thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil. But then, I mean, it's massive amounts, it's crazy amounts, but then he contrasts it with what God really is after. Three simple but very, very important things. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. 
Think about what might happen if our world, even if just this room, if we walked in those three things. And I want us to carry this away with us today. So I'm going to ask you to read this out loud with me in just a second here. Just verse 8 where it says this. Out loud with me. What does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Three things, Micah says. Three things. Anybody, everybody can walk and follow God in these things. So let me just real quickly unpack them for you if I might. The first thing he says is to act justly, act justly. Think for a moment about how angry, how mad you get when someone treats you unfairly, when someone cuts you off, when someone says something to you that you don't deserve. Not to mention all the crazy injustice in our world today. Uh, so former, um, a guy by the name of Dave Hagler was a former uh, umpire in baseball. He tells kind of a funny justice story. He says, like, this is actually printed in the LA Times a while back. He said, I was driving marginally fast in Boulder, Colorado one day, and a policeman pulled me over and gave me a speeding ticket. I tried to talk him out of it, saying I was just barely above the speed limit, and I, what a great driving record I've had my whole life. And he told me, tough. If you don't like it, you can go to court. That was it. Well, the next game, I was umpiring behind home plate, and the first batter up is that very same policeman. I recognized him, and he recognized me. And he just kind of stammered a little bit and said, so, uh, how'd that thing with the ticket go? And he said, I just smiled at him and said, you better swing at everything. <laughs> we hate it when people treat us unfairly. It drives us bananas. At work, in our family, in our neighborhood, in our school, it makes our blood boil. God says, act justly. Say that with me, act justly. Care about it as much when someone else is a victim of injustice as when you are yourself. God's saying, value justice. And in particular, value justice to those that might tend to be overlooked by others. And with that in mind, I will ask you to seek the wisdom of God's spirit on this and not just tune into the headlines or the news. Uh, most of us are wise enough to know that media and news are a for-profit industry. They are not neutral. They are not unbiased. They have an agenda. They have a, a, a desired outcome. And they will use their platform to point you exactly where they want you to go and what they want you to think and then believe and then feel and then act. Please don't be naive on that. We need the wisdom of God's spirit more in this day than ever, ever, ever before. So God calls us to act justly, contribute to justice, be aware of injustices. Now, I cannot correct all the injustice in my world, but I can do some things. I can notice, I can pray, I can ask God to help me treat others well, and I can Ask God for the courage to help me stand up for those that may be treated unfairly in my little world. And I, who have so much more than most, can be generous with what I have. With what I have. And I say those words very specifically because the fashionable take on all this is to demand that others give up what they have while I get to keep what I have. I demand that the government take from others and give to the needy so I can feel good about myself and keep what I have and vilify the wealthy because that's fun and that's woke and I better stop there before I get in trouble. The next thing God says, love mercy. So act justly and love mercy, God says. And the word that Michael, Micah uses there is this word hesed, H-E-S-E-D, hesed. It's associated with God's loving kindness that has been expressed over and over in the covenant that we learned so much about earlier. It's a love that always seeks to express itself in action. It's never confined to just a feeling. It's always associated with action. Uh, in a town called Paradise, California, uh, there was a young man that lived there by the name of John Gilborn. And when John was five years old, he was diagnosed with a certain type of muscular dystrophy. It's genetic, it's progressive, and it's cruel. He was told it, it eventually is going to destroy all of his muscle, and in probably about 10 years or so, it was going to take his life. And every year, they could track it, John lost 
something. One year it was the ability, the ability to run, so he couldn't play sports anymore with, with kids his age. Another year he could no longer walk even straight. All he could do was watch others play. And he's gone now, but he wrote a story of his life. And he writes that middle school was probably the hardest era of his life. Middle school is difficult for just about everybody. Uh, author Tony Campolo once said, he says, Roman Catholic theology may have gotten this one right. There really is a place called purgatory. It's middle school where people, are, it's a place between heaven and hell where people are meant to go suffer. <laughs> so he talks about middle school. But John was bullied and humiliated in middle school to the point where he didn't want to go to school anymore. And nobody stuck up for him. Nobody protected him, probably because they were afraid themselves. Now, there were some other better moments in his life. He was named the poster child for muscular dystrophy in California, and they flew him to Sacramento for a private meeting with the governor, and he's ushered into the governor's office along with his mom for this private meeting, and the governor has this big jar of candy on his desk, and he tells John to knock himself out, have as much as you want. And John looked over at his mom who said, it's okay for you to have one piece, but then the governor said, that he was the governor and he ought to do what he said. So John filled his pockets till they were overflowing with candy. Well, that night, the NFL sponsored a charity auction. It was kind of a fundraising dinner. And John was a special honored guest there. And the players let him hold their huge Super Bowl rings. And they would almost go up to his wrist because they were so big on this frail little kid. And when the auction began, there was one item in particular that really caught John's attention. And it was, it was a basketball that was signed by all the members of his favorite team, the Sacramento Kings. And John got a little carried away because when the ball was being bid on, he raised his hand. And as soon as it went up, his mom yanked it back down again. And John says, astronauts never felt as many Gs as my hand felt that night. <laughs> and the, the bidding for that basketball just kept on going up and up and up to an astronomical amount more than anything else at the auction, even though by far it was not the best item in the auction that night. But eventually one guy bid so high that it just stunned the room and nobody could match the bid. And as this guy went to the front to collect this wonderful prize that cost him so much, instead of going back to his seat, the man walked across the room and he placed that basketball in the thin, frail little hands of a boy who would never ever dribble a ball down a court would never throw it to a friend on a fast break, would never shoot a three-pointer. It was just a loving act for someone else for no apparent reason. So here's a question. You bought a basketball for anybody lately? God says, love mercy, love mercy. Do good for the people around you. We make it so complicated and it's really not. It's just not. So have you bought a basketball for anybody lately? Have you just gone out of your way to serve someone for no real reason at all? How about with people that don't get served a whole lot in our world? There's lots of serving chances out there if you look for them. And it's all a way to love mercy and love kindness. And maybe you're already doing that. That's wonderful. That's supposed to be our way of life. But it... If it's not, it just starts with a first step, just one simple step. And if God is prompting you to take that step, I hope you say yes. I hope you say yes to God. Well, then finally, after act justly and love mercy, Micah says, walk humbly with your God. And I think that phrase probably had special meaning for Micah because I think it's hard work to be a prophet and not get all self-righteous about it. I mean, honestly, anybody here ever run into somebody at a church who actually enjoys going around correcting other people? It happens. There's a kind of person who just loves to pass judgment in a, a spirit of arrogant superiority and then cover it up by saying, hey, I'm a prophet. That's just, you know, I just shoot straight. That's just the prophetic gift. Well, there's a, a very, very important theological distinction between being a prophet and being a jerk. <laughs> Don't be a jerk. Honestly, what do you think it is that burns most deeply in the heart of a prophet? What burns most deeply is not anger, it is love. Because a true prophet recognizes that he or she is one of the sinful human beings that have helped to mess up our world. So they walk humbly. 
They walk humbly with their God. And when that happens, when all this happens, when people act justly and love mercy and walk humbly before God, Micah says in this magnificent last chapter, chapter 7, in the closing words of his book, he just says this phrase, and that day nations will see. Nations will see. Not just Israel, not just one group, but they will all. Nations will see. They'll notice what God sees. Holy perspective will come. Now let's look at the closing words of the book of Micah. It comes from chapter 7. It says, There is no other God like you, O Lord. You forgive the sins of your people who have survived. You do not stay angry forever, but you take pleasure in showing us your constant love. You will be merciful to us once again. You will trample our sins underfoot and send them to the bottom of the sea. There is no other God like you. Nobody. And this prophecy was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus by his flawless life and his sacrificial death. It made perfect justice along with perfect mercy possible. And God took our sins and our imperfections and could now throw them to the bottom of the sea once and for all. Not repetitive sacrifices, but once and for all. There is no other God like you. And what does this magnificent God want? What does God require of you? He's made it clear. You can try to fog it up if you want. You can pretend to be confused, but that's not going to fly. He's made it very, very clear. Act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. That sounds an awful lot like the New Testament version of that, which we find in Ephesians 5.2, which has been our big idea at Life Church since day one, where it says, keep company with God and learn a life of love. Say that with me. Keep company with God and learn a life of love. That is how we can fulfill what God calls us to do. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. It is very doable with God's help. And I hope we're constantly calling out for God's help. I want you to bow your heads and we'll pray. Thank you for your word, Lord, which shows us the, the standard that you call. Thank you for the heart of the prophets who will point things out when something is not as it should be. And thank you for the season of the prophets which called the people back to your perfect holy standard. And Lord, we thank you for the, the New Testament revelation that comes to us, the new covenant in which our sin has been paid for and we have been released into freedom by your holy, precious blood, Jesus. Thank you for the freedom to walk with you in power and in authority. And Lord, you give us the strength to walk in these things, to keep company with you and learn a life of love. Always learning, learning, learning to walk in love. Help us to do that, Lord. That is truly our, the desire of our heart, Lord. We want to be loving people. So God, give us what we need, we pray, to step out and walk with you. And for those that are feeling a prompting this morning to give in some way, to serve in some way, to step out and do as you're prompting and calling them to do. Lord, give them the courage to take these steps out and walk in the freedom and the power that you've given to us freely. Thank you, Lord. We trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.